So can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, so my name is Anita Ho-Bailey. Uh, I'm very happy to see you all here. I can see a few Einsteins here and a few Marie Curies here. Uh, and uh, today I'm just going to talk about the latest research in photovoltaic cells uh, around the world and also at UNSW, which uh, we do uh, and we are very proud of what we do. And we do believe uh, some of the things we do actually sets the trend for the, uh, the, for the field of research in photovoltaics. So what is photovoltaics? Uh, well, basically a fancy name for solar cells for converting sunlight into useful electricity. It's a clean and it's free fuel. So that means during the conversion, you don't get any greenhouse gas emissions that will contribute to the warming up of the globe. Uh, also, it's available at the point of use, meaning if you have a fridge for medicine in some rural area or you have a, a water pump that you need to pump clean water, you can literally stick a solar panel out, out to the sun and if it's a DC appliance, you can literally power it right at the spot. So you don't need any uh, big transformers, high voltage, low voltage gear, or uh, poles and wires for transporting that electricity from the point of generation to the point of use. So I believe you have a booklet, is that right? With, um, yeah. Yes, with our interview. Yes. Oh, yes. So um, the, the reason why I'm in here is because when I was an undergraduate student, um, I was in a prac class and they have a water pump, they uh, have a solar panel, the only way to stop the electricity from gen being generated is to cover the solar panel. And at that point I thought this is a very, very useful and powerful technology and I want to be involved. So hopefully um, you'll be inspired as well. So uh, in the world, around 1% of electricity production is from photovoltaics, as you can see from the graph on the left hand side. There are countries who do better than that. So uh, mostly in uh, European countries where uh, in, over the last 10 years they have very good government policies encouraging people to put PVs on their roofs. So uh, the three big countries is Italy, Greece and Germany. And I heard there are no Italians or Greeks or Germans here in this audience. Is that right? No? <laughs> Never mind, I think they know what they're doing so they, need, they don't need to come. So in terms of renewable energy production, uh, we have chi in terms of capacity, we have China, uh, USA and Germany leading the world in terms of capacity. And I heard there are five Chinese students who just arrived this morning. Are you here? You're still awake? Good, great to see you. Uh, I, I myself have got at least 10 PhD students from China. There's a lot of people interested in photovoltaics and I'm sure every day you hear news about photovoltaic manufacturing ha happening in China. Uh, also, uh, the Americans are doing very well. Are you here? Where are you? Excellent, thank you. So uh, California in particular doing very well with photovoltaic installation and uh, thanks to the uh, exterminator, uh, I remember when I was a PhD student, I saw a piece of government document signed by Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, I just thought this is a very cool country. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Germans again leading the world. So being a curious sort of person, I thought I'll do some mathematics and see in terms of renewable energy production per capita, who's leading the world. Again, Germany is doing so. So even though Chinese, the Chi China and USA have very large renewable energy capacity, per person, they're not doing as well as the Spanish and the Italians. But fortunately, we've got quite a lot of countries who have got um, uh, renewable energy production above world average. So this is basically watts per person. Um, it's, a, it's just a, a number. Uh, but anyway, you can see Germany is doing 10 times better than the world average. Um, BRICS is just a name for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which is just an emerging economy. So um, hopefully in a few years time, if uh, one of my students become a speaker in a few years time, all these numbers will be much bigger and better. 
So uh, another interesting fact, and um, I just think is very encouraging, is that the electricity consumption has been dropping over the last um, 13 years. Is that right? No, more than more than that, uh, 23 years. So what is saying is we are a mo lot more efficient in the way we use electricity, and that's very encouraging because the world population is growing, going to grow. Our biggest challenge will be energy water and um, energy water and there's something else I actually don't remember. Anyway, so uh, it's saying that um, as we have uh, more people in this, on this planet, we are doing less harm because we are not consuming as much resources. Uh, and then uh, I found another report uh, on, the, on the news uh, last month. Bloomberg, who is an expert on business and he's got a huge empire doing you know, research analysts, looking at which companies doing well, looking at the uh, whole global business trend. They've done a, um, a study and has realized that over the last two years, since 2013, any new electricity generation plan that is put into place, that is built, uh, more than half of them comes from renewable energy resources. So, and the comment here is saying there is no going back. And in fact, Bloomberg has um, forecasted by 2050, half of the total energy electricity production will come from photovoltaics. And that's simply because of the simplicity of the technology. It's very well developed and you can easily put it on your rooftop and you just need a few bits and pieces and there you go. So my husband is an architect. He's already done a few houses that you know, make use of this technology and they're doing, they're, the clients are getting a lot out of them, mainly the, uh, the drop in the electricity bill. So if Bloomberg flashes this graph in front of you, and um, the statistics also tell you there's 7 million jobs in renewable energy. Probably you should look at this field and see any, any opportunity, any jobs that I, I can be involved in. So how efficient is a solar cell? Well, it depends on uh, how you look at it. So uh, a solar cell can be described as a black body. So a black body, if you want to visualize it, is just an object with a cavity inside with a hole. So a perfect absorber is also a perfect emitter, meaning when the light hits the hole, go into the cavity, it just bounces around until it eventually comes back out. So um, what this, um, what this um, Landsberg limit is saying is uh, a solar cell can highest can convert 93% of the sunlight, can emit 93 of the sunlight being absorbed if you can focus all the sunlight into one spot. So if you expose, uh, expose that black body to sunlight that is illuminates globally, then you, conf you can convert 74% of the sunlight. So the 7% basically is gone into here, uh, which is uh, to do with the converter being at an ambient temperature. So here will probably be 25 degrees or 30 degrees on a hot summer day or a 10 degrees on a, on a nice winter day. So where's the energy gone? Well, it's gone into uh, entropy, and so the, uh, the, the loss has gone into entropy. And um, to calculate the loss, we need the input. So the input comes from the flux from the sun. So you basically count the number of photons that falls onto your converter. So on this graph, you can see this is actually a sol solar spectrum that tells you the energy density. So it's basically watt per square meter, so it's number of watt per unit area for each wavelength. And if you integrate the area underneath the, uh, the curve, it will give you the photon flux. So that's the input into your system. And your converter is a black body, and this is just a uh, black body uh, radiation graph for this particular converter at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. So you put that into the equation, 
And in order to calculate the entropy flux is a little bit more involved. Um, you have this uh, sort of term, which is a function of the wavelength. Uh, it's also uh, determined by the Boltzmann constant, which describes the energy of the particle at a particular temperature. So you whack it in. Uh, this is something that spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet can do for you easily. You whack that in and it gives you those two numbers. So this is describing a solar cell being an emitter. So it actually doesn't do anything as far as electricity is concerned. So if you look at a, convert, uh, uh, a solar cell that extracts electricity out of it, your highest efficiency is actually 86% for concentrated sunlight or 68% for a solar spectrum that is illuminating globally. So how do you arrive with that figure? Well, basically it's saying that you have a black body that's got a photon flux, uh, energy from the photons coming from the sun, minus the uh, energy required to extract the voltage out of the converter. So, and it's also assuming this solar cell's got um, an infinite number of layers of solar cell that is optimized for each wavelength. So at each wavelength, each layer is uh, perfectly optimized as a perfect converter. So you calculate the, uh, convert, um, the power for each layer, you add them together and you get this number. So, but in real world, so don't, don't worry about the color curves yet, I'll, dis I'll explain this. So in the real world, you'll, you'll probably have a solar cell made up of one material with one band gap. So what does band gap mean? It means that uh, this solar cell, which is a semiconductor, if there's, you have sunlight shining on it that's got enough energy, it will excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band and will start to conduct. And this little mobile electron will leave the solar cell and complete a circuit uh, uh, electrical circuit to generate useful power. So say for example silicon has a band gap of 1.11 eV. It means that if you have sunlight, if you have light that's got a bit of blue in it, the blue light has an energy of 2 eV. That's higher than 1.1. That means it has enough energy to excite an electron from the phalanx band up to the conduction band, makes it mobile and complete the electrical circuit for useful energy. So if you have light that is infrared, which got uh, energy of 0 0.8 eV, which is lower than 1.1, that light would not be useful to the solar cell. So it hit the solar cell and go straight through because it hasn't got enough energy to excite that electron from valence band to conduction band and to complete the circuit. So. What we do is we calculate for each type of material with a given band gap and see what would be the highest efficiency that you can get out of it. So it turns out there's a sweet spot here, meaning if you have a solar cell made with one material that's got one band gap, the best material will be the one that's got a band gap of 1.1 eV to 1.4 eV. So anything that's got a higher band gap, you won't get as much uh, uh, energy conversion efficiency. Anything below that, you won't get as much either. So um, this equation, which describes the photon flux minus the energy required to, ex uh, to extract, to build, to build a voltage across to extract the uh, electrons out of this solar cell is called a shockley quiser limit equation. And it happens that it looks like a diode equation. So a diode, in this case, a solar cell diode equation has got a short circuit current, I'll explain what it means, minus a dark diode curve. And um, this J0 is called the dark saturation current. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand that, but what I'm trying to tell you is this number is really, really small. So it's uh, 10 times minus 12. So 
a small number times one is a very, very small number, so we can ignore that. And this becomes your diode equation for a solar cell. So um, if you go onto the internet, which I'll show you anyway, uh, this particular website is very useful. It's developed by our centre originally 20 years ago by Stuart Bowden. And he's moved to Arizona State University and he decided to make all the material online. So everybody around the world uses it. Um, people who's in China, people who's in England, um, even though they have no association with our centre, they use this uh, website to learn about solar cells. So if you have seen this, you don't need to listen to my talk. Anyway, so what he's saying is the IV curve of a solar cell is the superposition of the IV curve of a solar cell diode in the dark with the light generated current, which is not shown here yet. The light has the effect of shifting the IV curve down to the fourth quadrant. So when I click this button, you'll see an IV curve appearing here, which is just a diode current. So uh, if you, you've been taught at school about diode, all it's saying is current can only go in one direction, it can't go back the other way. And as I click the buttons, you'll see light coming in and it will shift the curve downwards. So uh, as the IV curve is shifted down to fourth quadrant, then power becomes minus, which means power is being generated. Um, and um, so illuminating a cell adds to the normal dark current in the diode so that the dial law becomes this. So you basically have a dark bit of the IV curve plus the light bit, which is the short circuit current. So if I click on that, this is a normal diode. So you pump the voltage, you set up a voltage difference here, current will flow through the dial in one direction. As you shine light on it, it will, uh, there is an additional uh, light generating light uh, current, current generator in the circuit which shifts the curve downwards and as you increase the light intensity so would this term increase, the magnitude of this term increase and therefore the shifting is more downwards. So um, people like to talk about things in positive terms so we usually flip the IV curve over when we report the performance of a solar cell. Right, so um, so I'm just trying to explain, you know, the maths and physics behind how you derive a solar cell diode curve. And um, everybody who uh, lives and breathes solar cells will know what, what the dial curve is about. And the job is to report the best uh, IV dial curve that they can, they can make. So um, if you remember, we calculated the efficiency limits uh, for a single band gap or a single junction solar cell. So that's what we calculated, but in reality, the best cells that are made in the world are all sort of below the curve. So why is that the case? Well, because a material, uh, materials are not perfect absorbers. Uh, it's, uh, we're assuming that if uh, a material has got a band gap of 1.1 eV, it will absorb everything about 1.1 eV. But in reality, it may not be the case. So you will, you will not have a square, a perfect square absorption profile. Also, uh, you have recombinations happening. So remember I told you when the light comes into the solar cell, it excites an electron. From the valence band, it jumps onto the conduction band, it becomes mobile, and it will just go through the circuit to produce the current. What happens is, so it leaves behind a hole, what we call a hole, so the electron's hole, and it completes the circuit, comes back, the electron and the holes see each other, they recombine. But what happens is, you may have a case where the electrons get excited, it's on the way to the circuit to, you know, go out and generate useful power, but it may see a hole somewhere for some reason. I'll tell you why. And they recombine before it gets a chance to get out of the, of the solar cell to produce useful power. So there are different types of recombination. Uh, if it takes me there, let's see. It does. Very good. So there are three main types of recombination. 
And I'll explain that before I play the animation. So um, the, the first one is called radiative recombination, which is just a reverse of the uh, photo excitation process. So the light comes in, it hits the, uh, it hits the solar cell, electrons get excited, uh, it, gets, uh, it jumps onto the uh, conduction band, uh, but for some reason it sees a hole, the electrons see a hole, they recombine, gives the energy to a photon, and the photon gets emitted from the solar cell. So whereby you, you, you can possibly excite a solar cell and see light coming back out. So, yes? Um, so the good ones are silicon, gallium arsenide, and what we do is we pick a material, we look at the absorption coefficients, uh, we, um, we do things like photoluminescence, so we actually shine a light onto a solar cell and how, see how much comes back out. So we actually measure the radiative recombination. And um, that will be a good measure of how much gets absorbed, and if it gets emitted, it, means it must have absorbed enough light to emit enough light. So, but you run into the trouble of OJ recombination. What it is, is actually a non-radiative recombination. So what happens is light excites an electron, and then it, uh, it goes onto the conduction band, and then it sees an electron, it gives the energy to the electron, the electron's already in conduction band, so it sort of goes up high to high energy levels, and after a while it relaxes back but it doesn't give the energy to a photon. So you don't, see the, uh, you don't see the radiation coming out of the solar cell. So it involves three particles, electron leaving behind a hole and then another electron. You have that when a solar cell is highly doped, when there are a lot of carriers in the cell, there's so many holes and electrons being around, it gives them a more chance to recombine. It's like, you know, putting more high school students in a room so there are possibly more conflicts. Sort of, sort of that analogy. And the Shockley Rehord uh, is a, a defect related uh, recombination, and uh, I'll probably show you on the diagram. So this is the band to band recombination. Okay. Uh, sorry that I didn't do it properly. Let's, let's see if I can do it properly. Ah, that's good. Okay. So this is the valence band, this is the conduction band. Light will strike. And uh, what happens is you saw an electron coming back down and gives the energy to a photon and emits light. And you have the chocolate rehaul recombination, which is introduced by defects. So defects can introduce forbidden gaps. Uh, that is in between the valence and conduction band. And this becomes like an extra step um, sort of like a ladder, like, you know, rock climbing. Oh, you see an extra step. It makes it easier for the carriers to come back down. So what happens is this excited particle will come down to this forbidden gap and gives the energy away either to a photon, so you may be able to see it, see the radiation, or give it to phonon, which is just lattice vibration. It just dissipates as heat. Uh, and the other one is OJ recombination, which got three particles in there. So you can see it just gives the energy uh, to an extra electron and just goes up and um, it's, not, it's not used for anything useful. So um, other losses in a solar cell is finite mobility. Uh, it is a, a photon generate carrier, it's mobile to a certain extent. It tries to you know, leave the solar cell and generate useful current but because it's got finite mobility, sometimes it may not get a chance. It just recombines before it gets to be converted to useful currents. Also, you get optical losses in a solar cell. So uh, reflection, uh, metal, you know, metal bars on the solar cell, light strikes, it gets reflected. Uh, glass, glass got absorption. So all the optical losses that are not in, uh, useful for current generation. You also have contact recombination. Where the metal touches the silicon, it's a highly defected area, 
So if there are lots of carriers around the defected area, they tend to recom recombine quickly, especially if you have an equal number of the electrons and holes. Whereas if you have a depletion of one of the species, you have less uh, chance of re uh, this kind of recombinations happening. Also resistive losses, for example, your metal contact may be too resistive, too thin, too narrow, too short. Um, you have high current, it doesn't get a chance to, it's like a very narrow high, highway for lots of cars, heavy traffic. So there are losses involved in the uh, solar cells. So um, this is a chart that produced by National Renewable Energy Laboratory in America. So they chart the uh, highest efficient cells over the last 40 years. And you can see the different color labels. The purple ones are the 3-5 materials. They are very expensive. They're a thousand times cheap, more expensive than silicon. But they have been able to give very good efficiencies uh, between 30 to 40 percent. Uh, also, it's, uh, um, we have te developed technology that we can grow different types of 3-5 materials with different band gaps on top of each other. So um, a lot of this defies a three-junction and four-junction solar cell. And you have the blue bit where the Australians uh, are champions in. So UNSW has been making a um, single-junction solar cell over the last 40 years. And uh, we are sort of reaching the theoretical limit. Now, a lot of people can make 25% cells, but we're still not quite there in terms of the 29% line that we want to sort of cross. Uh, and then you have the emergent technology. A lot of these uh, plastic, organic um, material that are not as stable, but their potential in there because they're solution process. You can, uh, you can print them, you can, uh, you can drop it, and then you spin it, and you can, um, you can cast it. So there's uh, this, what we call the emerging, te emerging technology, yes? So it comes from the shockley quiser limit that I uh, show you. So that, cr that uh, with the photon flux minus the energy required to take the uh, voltage out. And uh, it takes into account of the absorption coefficient of the silicon, which is not exactly square. So, um, yeah, so um, this is a graph showing all the technology. But 90% of the solar panels you see around the world is made of silicon. So why? Because silicon is abundant. It's the second most abundant material on Earth after oxygen. It's cheap. It's um, everywhere. Uh, it's from sand. You can purify it. It's high yield. When, it, when we say high yield, it means less breakage in the manufacturing process. It's high throughput, meaning it's fast. We can produce thousands of cells in an hour. And that is a good thing for a manufacturer. They spend all this money on capital expenditure. They don't want the uh, line to be idle. They don't want to make cells that constantly break. And they don't want the cells to come out slowly. Also, it's a very stable device. So silicon itself, it won't degrade in moisture. It's only the metal on top um, that conducts the electricity that will degrade against moisture. So um, I think that's uh, one of the very few products in the world that offers 25-year warranty. So I thought about that. So if who's, who's, uh, who's more than 25 years old? Yeah, so most of you are not. So imagine your mum and dad bought a solar panel before you were born and at no fault of their own, the solar panels break down. They can actually for, ask for a new one back. So I thought, this is quite good. I've got a four-year-old daughter. If she doesn't eat her breakfast through no fault of my own, I can't ask for a new daughter, you know. So um, <laughs> this is pretty good. So how do you manufacture a silicon solar module? Well, you start with the basic raw materials. You heat it, you melt it, you introduce gas into the uh, processing chamber and you separate all the impurities out, you distill it. Then you make it into polysilicons, who, which are just chunks or granites of low-grade silicon. 
And then you remelt it again, you put it into crucible and you just pull it slowly so all the impurities will segregate to the bottom or to uh, one type of um, uh, impur impurities will segregate to the bottom and one type of impurity will segregate to the top. And you have this uh, high purity, um, a trick, we call it Chokarowski ingot. And after that, you sort of flip it on the side and you just saw the ingot into thin wafers. So using a saw with diamonds on the edge, so it's a diamond saw, or wires with diamond on the wires and you just saw it with lots of slurry to keep the temperature down because as you saw it, it gets really hot. So you have the, uh, these wafers that are uh, 180 microns thick. Uh, how thick is a piece of human hair? Is it? Mm, I looked it up. Do we know? Uh, anyone know how thick is human hair? Yeah, probably. You can probably Google it very quickly. Let's do that. Uh, thickness of human hair. Well, there you go, 17 to 100. That's right. So, um, so it's basically a thickness of the human hair, or um, I don't know. Well, I think my hair is a lot thinner than it. So, um, it's very thin wafer. What happens afterwards is you uh, put it into a furnace, you introduce phosphorus on the top, and then you introduce boron atoms on the bottom. What it, what it does is, you, you remember there's a valence band and the conduction band. If you introduce the phosphorus and the uh, boron, it will actually make the band, one side band upwards and then one side band downwards. So um, the whole idea is the electrons in the conduction band, it's like a sl slippery dip. It will just make it easier to go to one direction and then the holes on the bottom will go to that direction. So all it does is to separate the charges, so we call, it's a good build-in uh, uh, voltage or build-in uh, electric field that separates the electrons and photons when they get excited. So uh, electrons go to the front and goes on to these white metal lines. They're not white, they're silver. And the holes will go to the bottom, or the absence of electrons will go to the bottom and uh, if you connect it, it will complete the circuit. So after you made the solar cells, what you do? You just lay them all on the table. So when I was in China, I actually literally see girls back then, 10 years ago, they will uh, solder, solder each cell. So the cells are connected in series like lights in Christmas tree. So positive, negative, this negative connected to this positive, Positive, negative, negative, positive. So, so you'll see the a wire just goes sort of on the top of the cell, comes down to the bottom of the cell, and this one goes. So you just interconnect the cells, and you put 64 cells, 128 cells in a panel, and you sandwich the solar cells between uh, polymer materials, EVA or Tedla, for uh, encapsulation and also moisture barrier. You also put it underneath the glass uh, for robustness. So solar cells go through a lot. Once they're finished, they go through environmental testing. Uh, you heat them to 85 degrees, you thermal cycle them. So you heat them to 85 and then you bring it down to zero degrees. Um, you accelerate the damage, uh, we call it the horror chamber, to make sure they can withstand somewhere in the middle of Australia, like a desert, or somewhere in uh, very cold places in America. Uh, they can withstand cold temperature. Also, hailstorms. So, um, I, I heard, funny enough, ages ago they used to shoot bullets onto the solar panels, just to make absolutely sure the glass can withstand that. Uh, also, the ones in the, uh, sol uh, in the space, they will have to work extremely reliably. Um, so it's a pretty reliable product as far as silicon, um, uh, silicon solar modules concerned. So uh, over the last five years, we've seen a huge drop in um, the manufacturing cost. So if you look at this curve, and uh, this is a, a learning curve, uh, so to speak. So what it's saying is, as you double the production of a product, 
you tend to follow a learning curve. So simply because of economies of scale, as you do things, uh, you repeatedly do things and you do more of them, you learn how to do it better, you learn how to do it cheaper. So this is a learning rate of 21.5% and the, um, solar, the um, price of solar modules reflect that learning curve. But what's interesting is what is happening there. So it's not, in fact, what he's saying is the price has increased with the uh, increased shipments. So what happened there was there was a shortage of polysilicon. So remember I show you a diagram, you know, you start with polysilicon, silicon, you purify and then, you know, go into ingot. So that, that feedstock, there was a shortage of it. So people were busy building, putting money and building those big plants and making polysilicon. So as soon as we catch up, you can see the learning curve here, the slope, is actually sharper than this learning curve. So what he's saying is over those last few years, the uh, reduction in cost is not only due to the economies of scale. It's not only because we do things a lot more, we just learn how to do it quicker and faster. There are, um, there are uh, advances, there are breakthroughs in the uh, making of the solar cell that makes it more efficient and therefore a reduction in cost. Because when we talk about cost, we're not talking about just the cost of making a solar cell, it's the cost per watt. So it's the cost of making an efficient solar cell that gives you more power. So if, I, if it costs me $10 to make a 17% cell and it costs um, Mr. Big to make a solar cell, same amount of money, but he, Mr. Big can make it 20%, then the cost per watt, according to Mr. Big, is lower. So here you can see the uh, contribution from the polysilicon, from the wafer, from the cell and the module. So you can see the final product has dropped by more than 50% over the last five years. And a lot of it comes from the red curve, which is the cell conversion cost, meaning people are getting better and making this cell. And interestingly, a lot of these cost reduction comes from China. Um, so China sort of makes 90% of the solar cells and solar modules in the world now. Um, which um, sort of um, because of a lot of um, government incentives for people setting up manufacturing there. So where do from here, how do we improve our solar cell from, so commercial will be 16%, laboratory 25%, theoretically 29%. So we're all trying to improve the efficiency of the solar cell perhaps marginally, what can we do? So this is a screen printed cell. What it means is the metal is being screen printed. So like how you screen print patterns on the t-shirt, it's the same technology. So you have a net and then you just apply the silver on top and then whatever gets through gets printed onto the solar cell. So it's got you know, a reasonable amount of phosphorus diffusion in there to cause the bend bending and reasonable amount of boron there to cause the bend bending the other way. Electrons go up, holes go down. So we uh, at UNSW, we have what we call the pearl type cell. We uh, do the uh, metal better, so uh, we make it thinner so that it doesn't shade the light from coming into the uh, solar cell because anything that is below there, the light doesn't get through. It just hits the, hits the silver and gets reflected out. So we make that thinner, but um, that technology is a lot more expensive. Uh, we also do a better job in terms of putting the phosphorus in there. Uh, we only make it heavy here and make it light here because if you have too much phosphorus here, the electrons will get a lot of OJ recombination, as I told you. Uh, yes? Yeah, so over the past that uh, people, uh, you know, when you pull the silicon ingot, we found that if we uh, put gallium, gallium in there, um, the segregation um, coefficient does not favouring the growth. 
So, but I think over, I think just recently people found that, well, look, they can uh, use a sort of a refined method of growing that Tchaikovsky ingot, and therefore they can incorporate gallium back into the silicon. So instead of having boron, uh, uh, a phosphorus doped n type wafer, you can, I think gallium is n type, uh, you can have used different uh, impurities to dope the material. So, um, Sort of gallium doped silicon, no one really wanted to look at it, but I think recently people sort of go, oh, actually, maybe we can try it again and uh, solve the impurity problems because there's a lot of science involved in growing the thing and make sure the impurities are all segregated into the parts that you want it to segregate to. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, and uh, on the back of this pearl cell, you can see that the boron is only incorporated in certain regions where the metal is, because it's only really needed where the metal is. And the other areas, we used an oxide to passivate, we call it to passivate the, uh, the, the uh, surface, so that the, uh, the interface or the surface, or the, um, yeah, the surface of the silicon will terminate better and will have less defects for those uh, Shockley re recombination, those forbidden gaps that I've shown you. Yes? Yes, so over the years they have uh, sort of perfected that technology, so they just sort of do one squirt and then they just spread it. So over the years they have been able to halve the consumption of silver by, um, what, within, so within three years. So um, uh, the aspect ratio, they can, they can print the silver taller. So if, if it's a flat silver, it sort of blocked the lights more, but they managed to uh, build, uh, sort of build it more. And also they managed to print silver that sort of talks to, talks to a lighter diffuse service as well. Um, and also um, their sort of impurities mix into the silver to make the printing better. There are various other ways of putting the silver down. So you can actually melt the silver and thermal evaporate it which we do at, uh, in the laboratory in UNSW. I, I noticed your question, I'll, I'll tell you. So uh, that's pure silver, and when you get pure silver, you get better conductivity. Yes? What makes silver the best metal to use? So it's got good conductivity, and the next best thing is gold, but it's a lot more expensive. So uh, we've also looked at copper, um, and we can plate it instead of printing it. And copper is also very good and a lot more cheaper. So uh, the industry uh, is definitely looking into various ways of doing uh, copper. They, don't, they can't print copper or they can mix the copper in. But we're looking at batch processing where you have a big batch of solar cells and you just stick it in the chemical bath and let the copper plate onto the uh, areas where you want it to plate. Um, the uh, problem with copper is it's not as stable as silver in terms of corro corro corroding. So, uh, and also copper, when it sees when silicon sees copper, silicon's not happy because uh, it can cause defect states and for forbidden gaps in the silicon. So we've got to be careful. So we don't want uh, silicon to see copper directly. All right, so I'll just keep going. So uh, there's another company in America called SunPower. Uh, what they do is they go, oh, forget about the metal on the front. Just let's move them all to the back. So you uh, remove the shading problem. Um, so the electrons just got to know that they've got to go to the N-type contact and the holes got to know that they go to the P-type contact. Um, there's uh, challenges, challenges with this technology. They're highly secretive, of course. Uh, so, so they should because they want to protect the technology. So if you don't do these areas well, the uh, carriers can get confused and then you have the shunting or shorting where you just um, get the uh, carriers confused and not going to the right polarity contacts. Uh, also, the Jap Japanese have championed the HIT petrol junction solar cell where they don't do doping. They don't introduce phosphorus into the cell. They don't introduce boron into the cell. Instead, they grow amorphous silicon on top and on the bottom of the cell 
to induce the bending. So um, if they call it heteral junction instead of homal junction. Uh, the beauty of this is you uh, have a lot lower OJ recombination because you're not introducing more um, uh, sort of carriers inside, so to speak. So another uh, advantage of this technology is it can passivate the service. So again, you, the word passivate. Um, so uh, because Japanese, as you know, they're quite protective of their technology, not a lot of people have been looking at it because they've got probably 100 patents protecting the technology. But the patent has run out over the last few years. So, uh, you know, all the universities around the world, now they can explore heterojunction and probably look at other materials other than amorphous silicon and try to improve the, uh, the um, technology and make it cheaper. So the beauty of this technology is also you can get much better voltage out of the solar cell. All right, so marginal increase. Say we, we can get to 29%, then what? Well, then we have to look at uh, maybe you, uh, having solar cell that's got more than one material. So you, uh, we will, we'll have to look at tandem, meaning that we uh, stack the materials right on top of each other. So you will have a material that has got, um, say, if you have a triple junction, then you will want the bottom cell to have a, a band gap of around, say, 1 EV, and the middle cell to have a band gap of around 1.5 EV and the top cell to have a band gap of 2 EV. And in this combination, theoretically, you can get an efficiency of 50%. So how can you do that? Well, you can mechanically stack them. So you can have a silicon cell on the bottom and then you have a gallium arsenide cell. Uh, you can bond it onto the silicon. You can glue it uh, as long as the glue is transparent. Uh, you can also have conductive glue, as long as it's transparent. After you glue it on top, maybe you can uh, lift off the carrier, so it's a called lift-off process. Just lift a tiny bit of gallium arsenide on the silicon, and you can reuse the gallium arsenide wafer. So you can just keep doing it, because the thin film on the silicon is only uh, nanometers, which is like a thousand times thinner than silicon. So there's one way of doing it, or you can do monolithic stack, meaning you can uh, stick the substrate into a chamber and you can grow material on top, or you can chemically vapour deposit the material on top. Or you can solution process material on top. You can print it, you can spin coat it, you can cast it. Or another way of realising this multi-junction idea is to use uh, spectrum splitting, so you have optical elements like mirrors, filters, um, band pass, long pass, uh, short pass, that will uh, only direct certain wavelengths of the sunlight to the cell that is optimized for that, um, for that sunlight. So here, um, you always, um, so if you stack them together, you always put the light, the uh, solar cell with the highest band gap uh, on top, and so the blue gets absorbed, and then the uh, lower uh, band gap light will get through, get through because, because it's, it hasn't got enough energy to excite the uh, electron. So we just go straight through, go to the middle, and then excite the, uh, you know, the, uh, the electrons there with 1.5 EV, and then the rest to just get to the bottom of the cell. So, recently we used uh, this idea to realize uh, a, a solar spectrum splitting system that's used silicon, so we managed to set a record of 40% at 365 concentrations, meaning we focus the sunlight, so it's set 365 more intense than normal sunlight that you would get. Um, so how did, we, how did that idea come about? So uh, we look at a, a commercially available uh, three-junction cell, and then we look at the IV curve. So we look at the gallium arsenide cell and go, oh, okay, well, you know, it, it can produce um, uh, 0.15 amps per watt and the gallium indium phosphide can do the same thing. Oh, oh hang on, germanium can actually produce more current, uh, 0.25 amps per watt. Now, 
if you remember your simple electrical circuit theory, if you put things in series in an electrical circuit, the current has to be the same, and the voltage adds up. So if you have a gallium arsenide cell, oh, sorry, a gallium arsenide cell, uh, a gallium indium phosphide, or called INGAP cell, producing the same current, and you have the germanium cell on the bottom producing more current, what happens? The germanium cell gets limited because every cell has to produce the same current. So we, go, we look at this and we go, oh, the current produced by germanium is wasted. So we thought, what if we actually poach the current off from the germanium by putting a splitter there? So we'll oh, poach a little bit of yellow light and poach a, bit, a little bit of red light away from germanium. And hopefully, by having the silicon there, it will boost the conversion efficiency of the entire system. So it sort of become a four-junction cell where you have 0.7 EV, 1.1, 1.4, 1.8. So here's the solar spectrum. The orange part is the solar spectrum. And this is the in-gap cell, the blue cell. It's doing its job and we're not bothering it. Let it produce the current. And the uh, gallium arsenide cell doing its job. And the germanium cell, we are going to put a filter there to poach some of the sunlight away from the germanium. So, and you also notice that with the silicon, we are not fully utilizing the silicon. We're only utilizing the, this part of the silicon. So this is the gray curve is the spectral response of the silicon cell. But in this case, we're only using this part of the silicon cell. So here's the spectra. And the other thing that we did was to concentrate the sunlight. So we have a big mirror, which is just a parabolic mirror, which... Uh, I think 40 years ago, children do. They just get a mirror and then they point it to the sun and they put a piece of paper next to the window pane and they, so I think my brother did it, tried to set the, uh, the paper on fire. So this is pretty much this similar thing that, what, that we are doing. Uh, we put a, a ginormous mirror there so we just focus the sunlight onto this spectral splitting and split the uh, cell. So here you can see in the photo, this is the mirror. So the light comes in, gets concentrated onto this uh, spectrum splitter, and it splits the cell. It splits the uh, spectrum into a silicon cell and a uh, three junction cell. So you have a tracker because if you need to concentrate the sunlight, you've got to follow the sun. So here's the tracker, and here are the gear that measures the input. So the intensity of the sunlight coming in as well as the output, so the IV curve of our solar cell. We also have a chiller because we don't want to set the cells on fire, so we're constantly cooling the, the, uh, the cell at room temperature. So before the uh, spectrum splitting, the 3-5 cell, the 3 junction cell, was giving 37%. After we add the silicon cell in there, we managed to get the 40% mark, which is a new record for any multi-junction cell that's got a silicon cell in it. So how can you use it? Well, you can use it for a uh, heliostat, what we call. So what we do is we find a big field and we store a whole lot of mirrors on the, uh, on, on the field. And the function of the mirrors is to uh, concentrate the sunlight onto a receiver on a solar tower. So uh, it will convert um, the available sunlight into electricity or heat. So on the receiver, what we can do is we have this sort of setup. We'll have the silicon and the 3-5 array and put the uh, splitter right in front of the cell, which is just a filter um, responsible for directing the appropriate sunlight to the appropriate cells. So uh, that was the spectrum splitting. And uh, now I'm going to move on to monolithic stack, meaning I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about putting a layer of thin film on silicon cell. So why are we still using silicon as a substrate? As I said, uh, it's cheap, and manufacturers have spent millions of dollars in their factory. They would not want to see a technology that would take that capital expenditure away. Yes?
And no. Yeah, so that's a good point. <laughs> um, so uh, what materials do we usually put on? We call it the 3-5 materials. Basically, uh, I show you gallium, um, gallium arsenide, indium, phosphide. They're all on these sort of uh, these columns of the periodic table. So we call them the 3-5 materials. We can also put others called the cal cogenide, I can't even pronounce that word, which are sulphide elements and including ZZTS, which is copper, zinc, uh, tin, sulphide, and also perovskite, which is the hottest topic, and I'll just uh, touch on that. So what happens when you bring the two materials together? Well, if they've got similar letters constant, you're fine, but if they're not, you will uh, introduce defects into the material. So this is a table showing the band gap of each of the materials on this graph, as well as the lattice constant. So three five cells, you know, the thirty percent efficient, thirty percent efficient, forty percent efficient. They sort of all are along sort of this this side of the graph where they have a lattice constant of around five point six. But we want to use silicon as a substrate. We want to use it as an active solar cell on the bottom, which has a lattice constant of 5.4. So what do we do? Well, the two ways of overcoming it is uh, what we can do is we can choose something that's got similar lattice constant and appropriate band gap. So this one's got a huge band gap. So good sunlight will just go straight past that material, doesn't get absorbed, and goes onto the silicon. What we do is we use that as a buffer. So as a buffer between the silicon and the 3-5 material. So we, uh, we, we put a layer of gallium phosphate and then we slowly introduce arsenide into the alloy and slowly remove the phosphide from the alloy so that we sort of slowly grow layers that moves along this curve and which got a very good band gap mix. So we want something 1.5, remember I said 1, 1.52, so if we can uh, grow our gallium arsenide in the middle cell, then we can put uh, in gap as the top cell, which has a band gap of around two. So what we do is we put the gallium phosphide as a buffer layer and slowly just grow and just keep introducing arsenide in there and removing phosphide, uh, as we call it, the graded buffer. And after that, we put the gallium arsenide cell. Now, this is a cross-sectional image of a very thin film, uh, and it's also a very thin slice of film. So the electrons can actually get through the film, and by looking at the transmittance of the or the transmission of the electrons, we can actually see features of the cross-section. So this is called a TEM image, uh, and as you can see. The starting materials got a lot of defects, but as you slowly, slowly grow, you elim eliminate the defects, and hopefully you get a defect-free gallium arsenide cell. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to stick them together anyway, and we anneal the defects out, and just try to, or what we call it, localize the defects here, so that the film on top will be relaxed. So this was the starting uh, germanium layer, as I've shown you before. Then we put it through thermal treatment. So as we, as we heat the layer, uh, the, um, the dislocation, or what we call the defects, will tend to move around, and hopefully we can localise the defects. Uh, we also use laser, which is a bit of a weird concept. You know, laser is also usually sort of associate damage with laser. But what we do is we run a laser on the film and we melt the film and as the film sort of uh, re, re, uh, uh, solidify, the defects tend to be uh, crowded at the interface. So we filed a patent on that and we hope that not only the laser annealing can be used for germanium, we hope that we can use it for other materials like gallium arsenide and other 3-5 materials. So we, don't, we can do away without the buffer layer because, after all, buffer layer can be a problem if it's too thick. Uh, it may cause a delamination or a, sometimes it may be absorbing light that you don't want it to absorb. So uh, perovskite. So um, 
I think Perovska has taken the uh, field of photovoltaics by uh, just by surprise. Uh, it suddenly just emerges in 2012. Someone managed to make a, a perovskite cell that is more than 10 percent, and we like, no, what is it? No one's even heard of it. And uh, over the last four years, the efficiency just keep going up. And um, it only take them four years to catch up to, uh, to the efficiency of cadmium terrain 6, which are commercially available film, film products uh, in the market, even though they are less than 10% of the market share. So uh, what is perovskite? Uh, it's got a crystal structure. So it's got an organic cation component, which is a large a methyl ammonium, which is a, a, a sort of a large you know, a large size molecule, uh, coupled with metal. Uh, in this case, the most efficient devices are lead. So uh, I've, I'm looking into a lead-free perovskites. Uh, hopefully that we can develop something that hasn't got lead in it, together with halogen. So uh, what's so good with perovskites? So methyl ammonium, lead halide, lead iodide perovskites, they've got good absorption coefficients. They've got reasonable transport properties. Uh, they're not p-type or n-type. They're actually intrinsic. Uh, some people call it bipolar, that the uh, electrons and holes can travel, travel uh, in any direction, depending on what heterojunction you put on the, on the side, on the edge, to pull to attract the carriers going in one way or the other. And also, they have low non-radiative OJ recombination. So a typical perovskite cell is a thin film cell, so it's 300 nanometers. Our silicon cell is 180 micron. Micron is 1,000 times more than nano. So it's a thin film cell, so it needs a substrate, so it needs a glass. So what we do is we fabricate it on a piece of glass. We don't call it a substrate, we call it superstrate because the light actually gets to the glass before it gets to the, uh, into, the, uh, into the solar cell. But when you fabricate it you, turn it, you turn it upside down so that you can put the materials on top, so it's called superstrate. So on the superstrate, you put some transparent conductive oxide just so to be able to extract the uh, carriers out. You have a hole blocking layer, make sure it's only electrons that gets there, so it blocks the holes away. And you can have the scaffold or without the scaffold, so they increase the surface area where the perovskite material can penetrate. Then you have the perovskite active layer, which is responsible for absorbing and uh, carrier generation, exciting electrons on from valence band to conduction band. And you have the whole transport layer, make sure holes will go that way, and electrode, and in this case would be silver or gold. So um, there's just different combinations of the materials which I'm not going to go through. But the beauty of perovskite is if you change the composition, you can actually tune the band gap of the perovskite material. So what it's saying is you can use it for tandem. And because it's solution processable, it may be possible that you have a silicon cell, a spin coat, one type of perovskite layer, which has a band gap of 1.5, and then you pick something which got bromide in it, and you spin code on it. And that way, you can just easily, just uh, with some solution, you can build a tandem solar cell monolithically. Also, another way of putting down the uh, material is by vapor deposition. So all it is, is you have the material starting as powder form, and you heat it, and you just evaporate it, like how you evaporate water and uh, you condense it onto the uh, coal uh, superstrate, so we call here. So if you put a piece of coal glass on a steam, you'll see the steam will start to condense onto your glass. So this is exactly the same way how we physically evaporate the film. Oh, so half an hour. So um, I actually, towards the end of my talk, so we've been doing quite a lot of work on perovskite lately. Uh, we managed to make the second most efficient uh, bromide perovskite cell in the world and using this vapor deposition where we just hit the thing and then just condense it onto, onto the uh, substrate. We also look at the optical property of the material to see the absorption of it. Uh, we also mm, 
um, shine photons on it and see the radiation coming out. And from that, you can get a lot of information of the material. You can see where the grains are and you can see where the carriers are doing near the grains, so the crystal grains. So um, like a piece of wood, you can see the grains. And in crystalline material, you can do the same thing. You can see the grains. Uh, and also we can see where they recombine, where the electron and hole see each other, they recombine before they produce useful electricity. Uh, we've also done theoretical calculation to look at uh, exotonic binding energy, meaning the energy requires to break the electron holes. Uh, we also look at probing, microscopy, and just um, uh, literally probe the material and see what happens at voltage wise. So we've done some calculations. So what happens if you put perovskites on a silicon cell? So you put a thin film of perovskites. Can we reach 30% or beyond 29%? And the calculation is positive so far. So remember I show you three diagrams of this three different solar cell structure. So we look at pearl and then the uh, sun power one with all the metals on the bottom and the uh, hetero junction where we don't diffuse phosphorus or boron, we just put the amorphous silicon on the bottom. Anyway, for all three types of solar structure, we think we can achieve more than 30%. But perhaps more encouraging is that if you, you, if you have a not so good commercially available screen printed cell of uh, six, 17%, you actually have a much better improvement if you put a perovskite cell on top. So uh, if you look at sort of the, the length of this histogram as a proportion of the original blue histogram, there's a much better increase as a proportion. So we get some money from Australian Renewable Energy Agency uh, to embark on a three-year program and we're working with a university in Melbourne, in Canberra, in Arizona, and also the biggest solar cell manufacturer in, uh, in the world, in China. So hopefully we will develop something interesting. However, with perovskites, that, that, there's a downside. So the, um, the areas of the cell has been small. So all the demonstrated ones are 4 milliliter by 4, four milliliter. Four millimeter by four millimeter, four, four, so it's actually this small. Um, the biggest module they've made is five centimeters by five centimeters, which is this big. A uh, commercially available module that you put on the roof is this big, so I don't think it will be a very Good module for installers to put onto, you know, on the solar, on, the, on your rooftop, one by one. So um, there's a big job ahead of increasing the size of these solar cells and modules. Also, they don't last more than 20 days or 40 days. So what are we going to do? I mean, what are we going to do with this 25-year warranty? So there's a huge, um, although there's a huge effort in improving the performance of these cells, there's equally important effort in making these cells more stable. And to make it even more confusing is when you uh, put the perovskite cell under sunlight or under light, it can do weird things. It can either improve or degrade. It all depends on how you make them. So there you get performance variation under light illumination, which is not good for solar cells. Also, um, you can see hysteresis in current and voltage characteristics. What it means is when you measure the solar cell in one direction, and then you measure it again in the other direction, it gives you a different performance curve. And this doesn't happen in silicon cells. So what we believe uh, until just last week, uh, we think, um, um, using a scanning probe microscopy, we think there's some mobile ions that are sort of happening, um, being mobile, that is, you know, not part of the electron uh, hole species that is making it or confusing, making, uh, having sort of uh, a, a potential, setting up a voltage potential in the cell that is in an opposing direction. So people have been speculating and different types of 
uh, measurements have shown that, and we've just recently shown using a different type of characterization technique that we believe there are some mobile ions there, probably the lead or the iodide ions moving about, making this curve worse. So, photovoltaics is a huge area. I've only talked about solar cells. Uh, they're, you know, if someone finds something new, which is just a new photovoltaic material, I'm sure uh, everybody will jump on board and want to work on it. Uh, modules, uh, people also uh, do different types of modules, building integrated, vehicle integrated, such as solar panels on cars, solar panels on bus stops and charging the display. A device integrated system where your laptop's got a solar cell that will charge your laptop. Um, the DC AC inverters, they are the weakest link in the system uh, where you, um, the DC power from, the, uh, from your rooftop systems goes into the main grid. They have a lot shorter uh, warranty, they have, you know, lifetime, five to ten years lifetime. That deserves a lot of attention. Batteries and charging system that gives people the autonomy that they don't rely, they don't have to rely on the electricity grid for their, um, you know, for their power usage. Uh, also, uh, is PV good for peak load? Can PV supply a base load? Uh, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good question to ask and uh, we, you know, we would like to be able to do both uh, in conjunction with good storage. So uh, don't feel that, you know, you have to be a scientist or engineer to be involved in photovoltaics. Uh, if you want to be an architect, you can see all these beautiful buildings, beautiful structures with solar panels, uh, making it all beautiful. And when it comes to beautiful buildings, people will pay the money. So, um, you know, this one is an interesting concept where they use concentrated photovoltaic cell with these filters and um, colouring the buildings. So, um, you know, photovoltaics needs you. <laughs> photovoltaics needs people who are not necessarily a scientist either. They need people who can finance the systems. They, can, uh, they need people who can come up with uh, very smart solutions. Um, you know, can you lease a photovoltaic system from your roof? Can you sell your electricity? Uh, how about policy makers? How about people who do arts degree? You know, can they come up with good transition for the, you know, traditional coal-fired generators to move towards this so-called the abrupt technology? Um, so, yeah, so this is the end of my talk, and thank you very much for your attention.